I'd like to welcome you all to our monthly nature talk. It occurs on the first Tuesday of every month. Um, this week we have Katie came with us and she's gonna be discussing the Ram's Head Lady Slipper. I'm just gonna quickly introduce her and then I'm gonna let her take over the talk. Um, so Katie King is a student at Acadia University and is finishing up a Bachelor of Science in Biology degree. Her main focus has been botany, particularly the conservation of native species. She has been volunteering and working as a research student in the E. C. Smith Herbarium and the Acadia Seed Bank for the past four years and has fallen in love with Nova Scotia's native biodiversity, especially the flora. Katie is planning on pursuing her master's degree in the fall under the supervision of Dr. Allison Walker, looking at Ram's head lady slipper and learning more about its relationship with the symbiotic fungi it grows alongside. All right, so with that, Katie, I'm gonna let you share your screen and take over. Awesome, thank you, Jess. You're welcome. No, well, thank you very much. Um, my name is Katie King, and thank you for coming to listen to me talk about Ram's head lady slipper. I was just hoping to uh, discuss a little bit more about the species and let you know some of the research I've been doing on it. And before we get started, I just wanted to acknowledge that Acadia University, as well as all of my field sites, are located in Mi'kmaq, which is the traditional unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Um, and, and this is it. This is Ram's Head Lady Slipper. Uh, this image here is my first interaction with this species. Uh, it's a little hard to see exactly what you're looking at, but it would be these thin brown sticks. Um, and so this was in October 2019, and oddly enough, from this encounter, um, I became very, very excited about this species and learning more about Nova Scotia's species at risk and uh, just learning more about plants in general. Um, a little bit about me to start. Uh, my name is Katie King. I just finished up my undergrad at Acadia in biology. and. Um, during that time, I've been working in the Casey Irving Environmental Science Center, so that meant I got to uh, interact with the Irving Biodiversity Collection, which is housed there. And what that is, is um, three kind of departments focused on three different facets of conserving Nova Scotia's native biodiversity. So firstly, we have the E.C. Smith Herbarium, which uh, focuses on the past of Nova Scotia um, plant specimens. And if you're not familiar familiar with herbaria, what they are is basically a library of plant specimens. Um, and so the E.C. Smith Herbarium has uh, records dating back to, I believe, 1860. So a lot of really, really old, very interesting specimens that have a great record of what has grown here and what have the conditions been. Um, second, there's the Harriet Irving Botanical Gardens, which is a really good representation of what is currently uh, growing in Nova Scotia. We have a very unique um, habitat around here, as many of you probably know, and uh, the gardens do an excellent job of representing that with many different biomes and different plants growing in them to, to help um, spread information and awareness about the biodiversity of Nova Scotia. And then we also have the Acadia Seed Bank, which helps um, preserve the future of plants in Nova Scotia. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, but one of the things that's really fun about being involved with the herbarium and seed bank is that I get to interact with a lot of students. And one of the things I always like to ask them is to see if they know what biome we're located in here in Nova Scotia. And, and they never do, which is fine, because I certainly didn't um, when, during my first couple of years here as well. But we're located in the Acadian Forest region, which is really, really important uh, because it's an overlap between two different biomes. So we've got influence from the boreal forest above us to the north and um, species from the deciduous um, temperate forest to the south of us. So because we're this overlap, we have a really unique, not only blend of species, but uh, a unique habitat. In addition to that, uh, we're also coastal and Nova Scotia in particular, where we're a peninsula, we have really unique species and very um, interesting uh, set of occurrences that has kind of formed the biodiversity in our region. And among those really interesting, unique species are a lot of orchids. And this is just an example, um, an image of a field guide that I, I quite liked that has a good, um, good information about the range of orchids that are growing in Nova, Nova Scotia currently. And um, 
that's always something that also kind of really shocks students when they find out that we have a lot of orchid species and a lot of them are quite difficult to encounter. Here's some, I've got a coral root over there on the left-hand side. Um, in the center, it's actually a purple fringed bog orchid. That's, uh, most of you might know that orchids often have a white variant. So this is a white variant of a purple fringed bog orchid. And then on the, the right-hand side there, that's tuberous grass pink. So all three types of orchid species that live in different habitats. Um, but you might be more familiar with uh, slipper orchids. And sometimes people forget that uh, lady slippers are orchids. So um, in Nova Scotia, we have four types of lady slippers. Uh, there's the showy lady slipper, which I don't have uh, in a, an image of here. But um, here I have the pink lady slipper, a yellow lady slipper, which we have a couple variants of, and then of course the ram's head lady slipper on the right. So the range of the ram's head lady slipper um, kind of interestingly overlaps very significantly with the Acadian forest region for this eastern part of it, which is significant um, because clearly the conditions that form our biome are having an impact on this species and what kind of uh, biological needs it has. Um, you'll notice in this image, let me get my little laser pointer again. In this image here, uh, it's a little hard to see, but Nova Scotia isn't entirely colored in. It's just a small area kind of centered around Windsor and that there's no, no shading in New Brunswick. And this is because it hasn't been found in New Brunswick yet. Um, it might be there, like you can see that it's uh, in Maine and on the border of Nova Scotia, right against Nova, New Brunswick. But what this means is that there's the potential that our Nova Scotia population is um, disjunct. So with that information in mind, we need to start considering ways that our population might be genetically different from the main kind of core population and what implications that has for our, uh, our populations of ram's head lady slipper. Um, another interesting, uh, oh, I've changed my screen, sorry. Um, another interesting thing about uh, ram's head is that um, while orchids are very, very sensitive species, there's actually three kind of different habitats that a ram's head lady slipper can inhabit. The first is kind of a, a cool swamp with lots of conifers. Um, it always requires fairly dense uh, shade from trees usually. Um, it can also grow in nearly pure sand if there's a limestone uh, bedrock underneath. And then usually as well, it, it likes uh, needles of conifer trees kind of mulched in the, the sand for organic matter. Um, and then there's also uh, populations that grow well on mesic soil with kind of a sandy loam or clay that have once again, a lot of shade, but this, uh, this habitat can have mixed hardwood and, um, sometimes will grow over limestone. So it'll just be a thin layer of soil over a dense limestone bedrock, uh, sorry, limestone or gypsum bedrock. And that's what we have here in Nova Scotia, which is really significant as well because most of the larger populations occur in that sandy kind of uh, habitat. And most of the research has been done on those larger populations. Um, it's also significant because uh, as with most species at risk, um, ram's head lady slippers had to deal with a lot of habitat loss. Uh, gypsum mining, obviously, if uh, the populations rely on gypsum to grow, gypsum mining is pretty devastating. Uh, forestry, clearing away those um, that shade cover is really, really damaging for the species, as well as any disturbances. Um, residential development or even uh, like road development that can cause a lot of issues. And then a lot of the areas that Ram's Head has been found to grow has also been previously or is currently used um, for agriculture. So cattle grazing or trampling by species is an issue for Ram's Head as well. And so in most situations when you're trying to preserve a species, a plant species specifically, the best approach is to protect its habitat. And that way it can stay growing alongside any sort of microbes and in the conditions it was evolved to, to suit it best. However, um, because of ongoing problems such as invasive species or climate change or acid rain, even if we protect the habitat, these species might still decline. Um, this picture here is, it's very difficult to see, but the lighter green leaves are um, small, uh, 
plantlets of ram's head lady slipper. And then the darker green leaves is a invasive species called blue sedge that is almost always found growing alongside and it really outcompetes the ram's head. So that's quite an issue. However, um, the good news is that in situations like that, uh, seed banking and seed collections are all the more effective approaches. So um, at Acadia Seed Bank, the reasons that we would want to collect seeds for ram's head lady slipper, first of all, would be to research the species and learn more about its biological requirements um, so that we could be able to help with restoration projects, either propagating the species or facilitate restoration um, or learn more information so that we could uh, develop an ex situ conservation approach. So by ex situ here, I just mean anywhere where it wasn't originally growing. So by either outplanting it in a botanical garden or um, helping maybe set up a translocation project, anything like that. And then last of all, just for conservation, when you have those seeds preserved um, long-term, you are able to have that genetic representation preserved long-term. So if there was a decline, we could still um, not lose our Nova Scotia um, genetics. However, um, because, sorry, in particular, because we don't know what ways this population is different from the main population. And just because this is um, uh, a certain, or sorry, because this um, impacts differently because of orchids, I just wanted to give you a quick overview of how we do conduct seed conservation at the seed bank. And this process for us begins with planning. Obviously, um, we need to know which species we're targeting. And in the case of a species like this, we want to uh, make sure that we have all the proper permits in place and that we know what we're doing. Um, and then during collection, we uh, have a lot of safe collection protocols that we are following, not just to make sure that we get a good collection that is representative of that species, but we want to make sure that nothing that we can do or nothing that we do while collecting somehow damages either that population or the species at large. So we never collect more seeds than we should, and we're really careful while we're working in and around those populations. Next, and almost as important as the collection itself is the data that we record alongside it. Um, it's kind of like the pedigree to that collection. We need to know where it came from, when it was collected, who was there, and who kind of verified that that was, in fact, the correct species that we were working with. In addition to that, we want to know information like the habitat, associated species, the time of year, all of these things that can help inform the decisions that we make when deciding how to treat and what to do with these seeds. Then seeds are processed. So um, in the case of orchids, we need to remove the seeds from the pod. Um, in other collections, we would count or weigh the seeds. And then um, the real kind of heart of the seed conservation is that we're going to desiccate and freeze our, our collection. It's been found that um, by desiccating or drying the seeds, every 10% relative humidity that we're able to lower the seeds, we can double their lifespan. And with the freezing, it's the same thing. For every five degrees, we lower the seed temperature, we can double the lifespan. So um, a seed collection that you might have from your garden that you can put on your shelf for a year or two and then still have good germination rates, if we were to take that and desiccate it to around 15% calibrated relative humidity and store it at negative 20 degrees, um, that collection could then potentially last for decades to centuries. So um, if it's properly maintained, which is why the next step is so important as well. Uh, when we first get a seed collection, we'd like to test it to see what kind of germination rates we have. And then throughout the storage period, we'll periodically try and uh, run additional germination trials to check to see that the seeds are still surviving. Um, a lot of larger seed banks do viability testing, which is a bit different, where you either um, cut the seeds open or apply tetrazolium, which is a carcinogenic chemical, or x-ray the seeds to see if they're still alive. We don't do any of that, partially just because it's a lot more dangerous. And partially, um, one of the perks to our germination protocols is that we can then use those plants. So like we said, the purpose of our seed bank is to help with either restoration projects or research or just getting more of those plants back out into their natural habitats. Um, just for a little bit more information about our germination testing, uh, it's kind of these three main steps, pretty much regardless the species. First, we sterilize the seeds, we will plate them on an agar media, and then we're able to observe for germination. Sometimes additional steps are needed, such as a stratification period, which is some time 
uh, in cold or uh, different um, inhibition factors need to be accounted for. But for the most part, this works on almost all seeds that we encounter, but it will not work for orchids. Um, so we cannot seed bank orchid seeds at the moment. Uh, orchid seeds are what we call unorthodox, which means they will not survive the desiccation and freezing step. So this is a huge problem. Um, there is a potential solution with biocryopreservation, bio which is using liquid nitrogen to very rapidly lower the temperature of the seeds to um, sub-freezing temperatures. However, because we don't have a viability testing method that we use, and we don't have germination testing protocols, we can't tell if this is working. We are, are unable to check to see the quality of the seeds before they're tested, and we're unable to check to see if our um, preservation methods has somehow damaged the seeds. So this is kind of all the background information to get you to where we are uh, when we started this project. So back to our very first seed collection in 2019. And um, this collection came about because our herbarium curator uh, received permit to collect seeds. Um, kind of a lot of the information I just told you was in his mind. And so he was decided that we were gonna try and see what we could figure out. And so we went and collected um, these thin brown mature seed pods, uh, which you can see here. And one thing with orchid seeds is when they split open, or sorry, when they're mature, they split open and the seeds are released. And in that second image there with the circle um, is actually an image of the seeds. And here's a close up and it's still, <laughs> I'm not sure, oh, it's gone along, but you still can't really see these tiny little dots. These are our seeds. So right off the bat, we're dealing with something that's very, very difficult to manipulate and difficult to work with. Um, and so we applied our germination, our standard germination kind of protocols, and they did not work. Uh, it was tweaked somewhat for an orchid project, but we really were kind of shooting in the dark and it didn't work. Dealing with the seeds because they were so very small was a huge challenge and our initial sterilization step um, didn't quite work as successfully as we would have liked. And so during the process too, we also had some contamination issues. Um, other issues when you're working with orchids is that they have very specific germination conditions. A lot of them require a mycorrhizal symbiont, which would be a fungal partner that will assist with germination. And they also require a photo period. So they have a germination time. The species is about six months, but it varies between species where they need complete darkness. And if any light does touch those um, developing seeds, it will kill them. And then also, like I had mentioned, where this species is unorthodox and we weren't able to hold on to that seed collection, that was the end of that until the next year where we applied for another permit. And this time we were not accepted, which is something, something that happens. Um, however, uh, the point of contention was over the number of seed pods. We realized that our previous attempt had been unsuccessful and we didn't want to uh, where we would just be kind of shooting in the dark. We didn't want to take more than what was an appropriate amount. And um, there was some question about whether the amount that we were planning on collecting was enough to actually successfully complete our tasks. And basically what happened is we had to go research a lot more than we had um, initially planned on it for this. Um, not just looking into germination protocols, but also larger uh, biological requirements and um, basically just all the literature we could possibly find about this species. So from this research, a couple things happened. First of all, I became much more interested in this project. Um, I also realized how I could uh, apply different components of this into research projects that I could use for my degree. And with this information, we reapplied for another permit in 2021, and we were um, successful this time. So... At this point though, I realized I really did need to have a better and broader understanding of this species and orchids in general. And so here is a quick little um, image of a typical life cycle of an orchid. This is a different um, Cyperpedium species, which is a different lady slipper species. However, they have a very similar developmental um, 
lifespan. And they start with a seed. There's some various protoquorm phases. Um, and then you've got your juvenile, your young adult, and your adult phase. Uh, perennial terrestrial orchids like this have a very complicated life cycle. Most of the orchids that people interact with are cultivars of tropical epiphytic orchid species. So these would be ones like you'd find at the grocery store. These originally were growing on trees somewhere tropical. And so uh, they don't have to deal with freezing conditions, whereas orchids in Nova Scotia do. So we sometimes forget that um, the stems and leaf portions of the plants are going to die off and have to grow back every season. Um, obviously, this is very energetically costly for a plant. Uh, orchids kind of the center of the plant is the corm, which is a little like a tuber, but not like a tuber because it doesn't hold that kind of dense nutrient reserve like a tuber would. It's just a small kind of base mass of tissue from which all of the, the leaves and the stem and the roots all come from. However, in years when um, they don't have the energy reserves, they will just choose to stay dormant. And Ram's Head Lady Slipper also does this. So either uh, you can see here in the image, um, the young dormant, the juvenile dormant and the adult dormant phases. Uh, Ram's Head Lady Slipper is known to stay dormant for at least a year at a time. Although sometimes these dormancy periods can last for one to four years. So uh, it's very difficult to track um, uh, a population in the wild because of these variances. Also, on top of this, because the corm doesn't act like a, a tuber and it doesn't have these dense um, nutrient reserves the same way that a tuber does, um, how is the plant getting its nutrients during that dormancy period when it's not photosynthesizing? Well, part of that is due to the mycorrhizal symbionts they have. Um, lots and lots and lots of plants have uh, interactions with fungal species. There's kind of two large areas where either they're an ectomycorrhizae, which um, have associations with 80% of plants. And those are uh, basically, if you're in the soil in your garden and you're digging and you see those dense kind of white net webby, it looks like roots, but you don't have much growing there. That's probably a mycorrhizae. And those are fungi that um, grow into the root tissue. And in this case, they grow directly into the cells where they can transfer nutrients and water and get sugar in return. And they're really beneficial for most, um, most of these interactions. There's also endomycorrhizae, which also grow into the root tissue, but don't enter the cell. And these are actually only in about 3% of um, known plant species. And they're usually very, very species specific. So we know that, um, the Iroquois family, so blueberries and cranberries, those have them, and we know that orchids have them. And in addition to this root sy symbiosis, orchid mycorrhizae is essential for germination. Um, during germination, there's two major roles played by the fungal symbiont. They eat through the seed coat. So this here, uh, in this image, it's a picture of a seed pod that's been cut open, and that is a little pile of the orchid seeds. You can see that there's thousands and thousands of them and they're basically dust. But each one has a very um, dense seed coat. However, unlike most seeds, it doesn't have an endosperm. So the part of the seed that usually would feed the developing embryo, orchid seeds don't have that. And so they also rely on the fungi to bring water and nutrients to that developing embryo during germination. So how do you germinate plants that you don't have the fungi to go alongside? you have to somehow remove the seed coat on your own. You have to force water into the seed, and then you have to somehow provide it with the nutrients it needs. And so fortunately, throughout my research and stuff, I did stumble on some really great resources, one of which um, was very Ram's Head specific. But like I said, a lot of these resources are um, intended for these populations that have been growing in the sand dunes, I believe in Michigan. And so they likely have very different fungal partners and very different um, reactions to their habitats. However, it kind of gets us back on track now, back with the story. Um, August, 2021, I was able to start my research on this species again. So started with the seed collection, but this time instead of going for the um, brown mature seeds, oh, I've gone back. 
sorry. Instead of going for the brown mature seeds, um, we wanted these green seed pods here. And uh, there's two reasons for that. First of all, um, when you collect seeds, if they're a little immature, but you still have them either in the seed pod or on the branch, usually they can mature um, further on the shelf, even though they're uh, detached from their host or I guess parent plant. Um, but the important reason was because uh, inhibition factors, which are really common in a lot of seed species, especially uh, really sensitive ones, those are usually one of the later things to develop during um, seed maturation. And so uh, an approach with orchid seed collection is to collect it before um, those inhibition factors have, uh, have had the chance to develop. And so um, doing a germination trial on this species was very different from what we usually do because we had to incorporate all these additional steps. So uh, the first image here, I have a vacuum pump system where uh, we had the seeds soaking for uh, I believe 24 hours and then we were able to pull a vacuum and that helped force the water into the seeds. Um, the center picture there is uh, a filtration system that we were using a bleach solution to remove the seed coat and then the last picture there is a series of different types of media that we plated the seeds on, um, hoping to find one that worked well for Ram's Head Lady Slipper. And once again, just because I do find it really interesting how tiny the seeds are, this is a close up of the seeds while their um, seed coat is being bleached. And in some of the images, you can see how uh, the longer seed shape um, is still there, but all that you can see colored is these tiny little black dots and that's just the little the last little bit of the seed coat around the endosperm um, before it's kind of all cleared off and so another thing like i mentioned before orchids require a very strict photo period um, however we were fortunate enough to have access to uh, dr dave christie's lab where he's done a lot of experiments on light and he um, was able to provide us with the safe light so a green wavelength um, is something that would usually be filtered out by the canopy and a lot of plants don't react to it as much as they would either red light or blue light. And so in using this green safe light, we were able to observe through the six month photo period. So things like contamination um, or if the agar had somehow dried out, we could check on the seeds and help better take care of them. And fortunately too, during this period, we did have success with germination. So you can see in the center picture, that is a tiny, tiny little corm developing. And in the picture on the far right there, that is um, what was labeled as a stage three protocorm, where we've got the longer root shoot and then the, just the beginning of what will become a stem. Um, one of the benefits to uh, growing them with this uh, safe light is because usually after a six month period, you would just open the plates and whatever you have is what you have. Where we were able to, to check on them periodically, um, we knew when we had our first seeds and we were able to remove them. And then in addition, what we did was set up a, a sterile flow hood with that same green light so that as we were taking seeds and putting them in a growth me media, um, we still weren't exposing that plate to, uh, to any sort of light other than the green safe light. And what that resulted in is that um, we are still able to have ongoing germination on those plates. So I'm still getting seeds that are germinating over a year later on those plates. And so our, uh, our overall kind of results are, are much more than what we expected if we had just opened the plates to light and let all the remaining seeds die. Okay, so I recognize that at this point, we're getting a little bogged down with lab work. And so, um, even though that's a part of the process that I really, really do enjoy, I find it does get more enjoyable when I get to intersperse it with some field work and getting to act, interact with the species. And so uh, we're gonna kind of pause that for now and look more at some some uh, pictures of the wild. And, and this kind of still worked as well uh, chronologically as um, last May, the herbarium had been um, Asked, specifically the herbarium curator had been asked to uh, help undertake some population surveys on the ram's head lady slipper populations in Nova Scotia and so I was able to assist with one of those and so this is some um, of the interactions I was able to have with them um, so first of all is uh, lady uh, ram's head lady slipper begins to emerge right around this time of year into June and 
typically they will flower from kind of end of May into June as well. However, like we mentioned earlier with the dormancy where not all mature plants will emerge, not all mature plants will flower. It varies year to year. And um, once again, it makes it very difficult to kind of monitor numbers and the health of a population because we can't really tell how many mature, uh, how many mature individuals we have or um, what the status of that population is other than just kind of population counts from individuals who have a like good understanding of the species and are familiar with these populations. Another thing that's really interesting about ram's head lady slipper is um, it typically takes in the wild about 10 to 16 years before a plant will produce its first flowers. So once again, this hasn't been extensively studied because it's really difficult to tell how old each um, individual plant is or how old a population is. However, based off of similar species and what we've observed, that is the general understanding. Oh. Um, another interesting thing is that these plants are actually very, very small. Um, they typically, uh, a non-flowering plant will be between about five and 15 centimeters and a flowering plant will be between about 15 and 30 centimeters. And um, morphologically, it's quite similar to a yellow lady slipper, except for it's just so much smaller. Um, however, it is quite similar to the picture on the right here is uh, Eastern Helleborin, which is an exotic orchid that grows in Nova Scotia. Um, so those two would be really easy to confuse. Although the Helleborin, I find the leaves are a bit more robust and the ram's head, it kind of has a bit of a wave at the margin. So there are some differences. And obviously if it's in flower, you can tell them apart, but otherwise it is quite different to distinguish. Okay, so that was kind of the end of my field season with uh, the species. And at this point, um, the specimens that I have growing in tissue culture are progressing really well. And I needed to start thinking about how I wanted to transfer them into a garden or into some sort of substrate. And so the approach I decided to take um, with the help of the Harriet Irvin Botanical Garden um, was I applied for an additional permit to collect the soil adjacent to a plant. So that's what's in that picture on the left. Um, you can kind of just barely see the little brown stems of a ram's head lady slipper plant and my trowel about half a foot away from it. And while in my permit I was allowed to take something like 100 liters of soil, I ended up with much, much less than that because I really wanted to make sure that nothing that I was doing would disturb the plants or somehow endanger them or expose them to, to any sort of um, dangers. I then took that soil and uh, was able to incorporate that into eight different soil treatments in the Harriet Irving Botanical Garden Experimental Gardens. And so using either the mycorrhizal soil or some gypsum gravel or sand or hardwood leaves that were supplied by the gardens or poplar logs, which were also supplied by the gardens, I kind of made different soil treatments. And um, I'm going to, in the next couple months, outplant my plants into those to see how they, um, how they respond and if we're able to observe uh, the ways that they can take up some of the, the mycorrhizae. Um, the log treatments I'm particularly interested about because I don't know if you saw or noticed in some of the pictures I've shown you, a lot of times when we found a really robust flowering clump, it was right next against some deadwood. And poplar is one of the species that commonly grow among ram's head lady slippers. So we selected that. And now we really don't know why this is or if it is even a factor, um, but we just were able to observe that whether it's mechanical, maybe it's um, blocking the wind or maybe animals aren't walking as close to the logs and trampling them there, or maybe it's chemical, maybe um, it's leaching nutrients into the soil or somehow attracting more mycorrhizae. We're not really sure, but I'm really looking forward to trying to find that out. Um, and the way that we're gonna do that here is basically just, uh, you'll see how they're all off to one side. We're gonna plant some, right up against the logs and some farther away. And we'll just kind of observe and see what kind of differences we see. And so to prepare my plants to go outside, uh, we are giving them a vernalization treatment. Um, anyone who is familiar with gardening uh, might also know this term. Um, like I said, it typically takes 10 to 16 years for uh, the first flowers to come about. However, vernalization is a technique where you can um, expose plants to a cold period to trigger earlier flowering. And so uh, the literature suggests that perhaps um, 
you can reduce the time from 10 to 16 years to two to five years to, to produce flowers. So we're hoping to see if that will work. And so what we did for vernalization treatments, because my seeds germinated over such a range of time, um, not all the plantlets were mature enough to go into a, a full vernalization treatment. So I have some groups that I just kept on the growth media and they went under light and those were kind of kept there. Some were put on uh, in the vernalization, but they were left on their media. And that's um, in that second picture there, that's just a liquid media with, uh, it's all the same nutrients as my agar media. It's just, um, we were noticing sometimes the ram's head, the, the roots were having a hard time digging through the agar. And so we tried putting them on a little bit of rock wool with a liquid media instead. Um, but the plants that were mature and ready to go into a full vernalization, they were taken off of their media and we put them either in a petri plate, this one's like a four walled petri plate, we put a little bit of filter paper to hold onto the water and just a little bit of RO water, which would be reverse osmosis water. And some of the plants were actually even too big to fit in that. So they went in their own little jars that we call magentas, but it was the same kind of cold dark treatment for four months on nothing but RO water. Unfortunately, during this time, there was a contamination event in the tissue culture lab. Um, and so the light treatment uh, all became contaminated. So um, I've included this part just to kind of show you why we're trying to deal with sterile conditions at all, all times while we use the flow hoods and why um, we were worrying about sterilizing the seeds at the outset of this. The contamination um, is a huge issue because it will definitely eat away these plants. They're grown in such delicate conditions in the tissue culture that they really aren't suited for uh, exposure to just about anything really. And so uh, contamination can really, really damage a small plant. However, um, a really good solution is if you can sometimes catch it early enough and then plant it, the uh, bacteria and fungi that we have just in the atmosphere and in soil often can combat whatever contaminant you're dealing with, which would be also bacteria and fungi. But um, once it's kind of released to the environment, it, it stabilizes a bit better. So sometimes we can do an emergency outplant. And that's what we had to do in this situation. Um, unfortunately, this was in February, so I didn't have access to all my beautiful mycorrhizal soil that I was ready to, to put these plants in. And so I had to improvise a soil treatment. And so unfortunately, um, it seems like that group has declined. However, um, it's kind of not all lost. First of all, this um, kind of inspired uh, an intermediary out, out planting process for me. Um, I was originally trying to figure out how I was gonna get these plants from the vials into the garden without putting them in soil in the potting shed because I didn't want, I wanted to have them exposed to the mycorrhizae without having to transplant them, transplant them, transplant them. And I don't know why it took this situation to make me realize that I, I could just collect soil from my garden and plant them in that inside and then take them outside. So it's a funny kind of in-between step which complicated things. However, um, it does look like most of those plants because a lot of them were still very immature. They haven't grown, but we haven't given up hope on them yet either. Um, but for the rest of the plants, they have just as of the beginning of the month been outplanted into that treatment. And so uh, this is the exact same view. One was taken very early this month. And then the picture on the right was just taken yesterday. So you can see how well um, some of the specimens are responding to this treatment. Um, but I think it's so interesting to look at this plant and realize that these plant, like these tiny little sprouts that we're looking at are, are over a year and a half old now. And so it really is a very slowly maturing species. Um, estimates are that uh, ram's head lady slipper typically live to be about 25 years old. And so uh, it's definitely um, on this end of uh, observations, I can see how that would be. Um, and that kind of brings us to one of the last elements of their life cycle, which is reproduction. And while obviously they can um, be pollinated and do produce seeds, that's not the most common form of reproduction that we see with ram's head lady slipper. Um, in this image here, this was one of those plants that I had originally had to outplant because of the contamination event. And the soil treatment didn't seem like it was really doing that great. And so I took the ones that looked like they were starting to die back, rinsed off the old soil, and I did plant it in the mycorrhizal soil. However, um, 
in doing that, I was able to notice this little shoot that's growing off. And this is kind of the primary mode of reproduction for the species is a vegetative. So from the corn, a new shoot will come up and then continue to multiply and spread that way. And um, that kind of brings me to where I'm at with this project. So the next steps will be to outplant these living plants that we have into the garden treatments, um, continue with the soil analysis. Hopefully we'll learn more about um, what fungi that they are associating with and if it's the same as the ones we're finding in Michigan in the sand dunes or if we have something special, it would be wonderful to do some genetic analysis and really look at the differences between the Nova Scotia population and the, the rest of the main part of the pro po population. Um, with these plants, like we said, they're very long living species, so they will require ongoing observations and care. And ideally, um, I do have some that I've kept on the media in tissue culture, and hopefully we'll be able to learn more about the species and how they grow from that. And so at this point, I'd just like to acknowledge um, my wonderful supervisors, uh, Dr. Allison Walker and Dr. Juan Carlos Lopez, who helped me with this project, um, Alain Bellevaux, our herbarium curator, and Dr. Robin Brown and Dr. David Christie, who were huge sources of information. And then also Christiane Hagerman, Kendra Simpson, and Sarah Adams, who um, hugely helped me with all the parts of my project. And thank you very much. Thanks, Katie, that was awesome. Um... I can tell you put a lot of care into it, especially you took the the photo um, just today of the seedlings. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Um, so yeah, with that, I'd like to open it up for questions. Um, I think Wendy has a question here and they were wondering, who do you apply to for permits? Um, so when we apply for our permits, we send that to uh, the Nova Scotia um, Natural Resources and Renewabilities, um, their biodiversity department. Um, they have uh, online, you can find it. They have a bunch of different permits for a lot of things. And a lot of the ones that we are applying for are things like um, either uh, to a permit that allows us to interact with the species at risk or a permit that allows us to conduct scientific research on a species at risk. So those ones specifically. So it's it's a provincial permit. Um, and yeah, if there's if there's any other questions or any follow ups for that, you can uh, post it in the chat or just raise your hand. Uh, we have another question here from Gavin. Um, they're saying so this orchid can germinate without its mycorrhizal fungus. Is that correct? Um, yes, as long as you conduct the steps that would be done by that fungus. So, um, it. It still needs those actions to happen, whether it's done by the fungi or whether it's done by us in the lab. Uh, you can kind of trick it. So yes, you can germinate it, but that's something else that we're not aware of yet is how long it will live without this association too, which is why um, I've incorporated the mycorrhizae in the soil where I'm going to outplant it, but I also have some plants that I've kept back that I'm going to, um, hopefully they'll do great, but otherwise we're going to keep an eye on them to just see how that difference affects them throughout the duration of their lifespan. Interesting. Um, so one of my questions is, um, so say in 2019, when you, you got the permit for the seeds, right? So then were you able to still use those seeds and try and germinate them in 2020 when you didn't get the permit? So yeah, one of the problems with the, the germination process, um, in 2019, when we started, we were uh, we hadn't started using that safe light yet. So what we did is we took all our plates and they were wrapped in tin foil and then put in kind of a dark box and then you let it sit for six months because that's typically how long the germination takes. And so the problem is at that point, you've kind of left the seeds on the shelf for so long too that they're not really reliable. We could have probably taken them and also started another trial to try in another six months. But at that time we were applying for the permit and we kind of thought we were gonna get it. So we hadn't really put that that forethought into the situation. Okay, uh, another, another question here. Any consideration of trying to explore vegetative propagation for conservation? Yeah, no, that's a really great question. And I don't think I explained it enough too, but a term that I used a couple of times was tissue culture. And um, at the, the KC Irving Center, there is a tissue culture lab. And basically what 
is done there is uh, we keep all the plants in the vials and they're all very sterile. And what we do is we take samples of that tissue and propagate it out again. So yeah, that's a really viable approach. And I'm really hoping to uh, explore that. Um, something that I've noticed so far is, like I said, these plants are really delicate. And so um, even just as they've been growing and if I'd noticed a little bit of decline in the roots, in a usual plant, we would just trim that off and it would grow back. Uh, I've tried that with this plant and it seems to die off quite quickly. So I definitely do think that vegetative propagation is a great approach, but I think we might need to, to kind of figure out some, some different techniques to make it work on this species. But yeah, it's a really good question. Another question here. If an average member of the public were to come across a plant, what would be the best route to report the finding? Um, Actually, a really great uh, approach is iNaturalist. Um, one of the things that's really nice about that pro platform is that if you are um, sharing information about a plant that's been flagged as a species at risk, it automatically um, hides the location. A lot of you probably know this, but it hides the location so that you could report it, but that's not going to cause a ton of people in the public to flock there and then maybe endanger the plant. However, there are different organizations like, um, I know our herbarium curator kind of scans. I know that the Atlantic Canada Conservation Data Center um, and also even uh, NSDNR are, are noting when species at risks are, um, are submitted to iNaturalist. And so it will get, uh, it will get kind of noticed there. Um, also, if you take pictures and you could probably email uh, somebody from DNRR, the biodiversity um, program, and I'm sure that they would appreciate to, to get the heads up there too. Although a lot of, um, like I said, it's very habitat specific species. So we know that it really requires those calcareous soils on gypsum bedrock. And so a lot of those populations have been very thoroughly surveyed, but at the same time too, it certainly doesn't hurt to, to report. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not like they're, uh, they're not moving around. So no, exactly. Yeah, it's one of the nice things working with plants as opposed to animals. Um, one question here. Did you collect any from the Angevine Lake population? No, I have not. Um, our permit only uh, um, allotted us a very specific location and actually um, a very specific time. I only had one month where I was allowed to collect. So I'm really glad that the, the seed pods were at the correct maturity in that time. But yeah. Uh, have you identified different mycorrhizal fungal species associations in Nova Scotia in Nova Scotia compared to other sites? Um, that is actually going to be hopefully the the focus of my master's research because um, there has been very little work done on that and none done in Nova Scotia so far. Well, that's not true actually. Some preliminary work has been done in Nova Scotia, but identifying um, mycorrhizae is really really tricky because you're trying to get not all the different types of fungi that are in the soil and not the fungi that's in the air, the ones that are specifically in the root tissue, but is not the root tissue of the plant. So it's a really, really finicky process. And so um, uh, the lab that I am, um, Dr. Walker's lab has uh, done work on this in the past, but they haven't had any um, conclusive results. And so that's what one of the things we're looking at. And I'm really looking forward to comparing this because fungi is even more kind of habitat specific. So the ones that we see here in Nova Scotia, there's a very good chance that um, we might find something different that compared to the ones that we're seeing at other sites. So besides, um, oh, another question. Has any core habitat been identified by DNRR? Um, I believe it has. Uh, I know that this is definitely a species that they are paying a lot of attention to. And um, there are multiple, uh, status reports and um, monitoring reports. And so uh, core habitat, especially lately, actually has been a really big focus of uh, a lot of the surveys and a lot of the um, analysis done outside of the surveys. So I'm I'm pretty sure, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure. Yeah, we're um, we're really into core habitat at Nature Nova Scotia, so. <laughs> That's awesome though, yeah. It's, it's like, like I said, the best way to preserve a species is preserve its habitat. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, what I was going to say earlier is besides sort of like reporting it to the right people and uh, taking photos, keeping track of it, uh, what else can the general public do to help like um, keep the species around? Um, 
personally, I think the biggest thing is that if you do encounter it, um, don't touch it. They're very delicate and breaking off a stem. Um, like I said, all of that growth is extremely energetically expensive and the plant might not be able to regenerate or not may, might not be able to come back after that, especially if it was a flowering head. Um, a problem, especially with lady slipper orchids, and I'm sure you guys are all aware of this, is that when people pick them, it's just so damaging to the plant and they are so beautiful. And so I definitely encourage if you find some, please take some pictures. They're really stunning, um, but definitely stay away. Other than that, um, it's a pretty difficult thing to approach. Uh, fortunately, it's one of the species that is um, higher profile. It's it's a very charismatic species. Not all plant species have that um, advantage. So I do know that it's got a lot of um, like, from DNRR and other organizations are putting a lot of research into it and also a lot of attention into preserving it, so. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah. Um, because yeah, a lot of people see those pretty flowers and they might pick them, but I mm -hmm. believe it's actually illegal to tamper with any of the orchids, so. Um, just keep that in mind. It's probably not anyone who's uh, participating in this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, um, uh, one more question. What was the name of the species that was more isolated to one part of the province, Windsor? Um, so that's still the same species of ram's head lady slippers. So it's Cyperpedium ariatinum. Um, and so that's the one that, yeah, it's the same species in that whole kind of core population. Um, and then for some reason, not in New Brunswick, and then only in the Windsor area in Nova Scotia. So that's really interesting. Um, yeah, I'll be I'll be excited to hear more about the uh, genetics of that, and I guess like potential implications of having the isolation stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So I guess with that, if there's no more questions, I'm just kind of like leaving it open ended. But um, I just wanted to give a shout out to. Um, Nova Scotia Wild Flora Society. They're one of our uh, members and they have a lot of events and things going on around plants. So they're a great group to join. Um, and yeah, Nature Nova Scotia has Bird Week events coming up. Celebration of Nature, May is a pretty big month for us. Um, and yeah, just thank you so much, Katie, for the presentation. It was great. And, you know, I learned a lot. I was surprised at how small the plant was. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's really, really interesting stuff. And keep up the good work. No, um, thank you so much for having me. That was really fun. Yeah. And thank you, everyone, for coming. And we'll see you next month. We're doing a talk on monarch butterflies. So that'll be exciting. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night.